Hi, Carl Willis here in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and I'd like to share with you today an absolutely fascinating relic from the dawn of nuclear science. This is a piece of the world's first nuclear reactor, the Chicago Pile, CP1, which was built under the west stands of Stag Field back in 1942. And it has the distinction of being owned by one of the preeminent physicists whose work went into the design and construction of that reactor, Herbert L. Anderson. Herb was born in 1914 and lived an illustrious uh, life in the world of physics. He died here in New Mexico in 1988, and this piece of the Chicago pile uh, was afterwards in possession of his wife, and now uh, it is in my possession, for which I am most grateful. I think it is a truly unique example of the arrangement of the moderator made out of graphite and the nuclear fuel, in this case uranium metal and two slugs, that were uh, used in that nuclear reactor. The block here exhibits a number of the important physical properties of that reactor. It was a heterogeneous design. They knew that they had to, uh, they couldn't mix the fuel intimately with the moderator or the reactor wouldn't work. They had to uh, solve the problem of resonance capture in the, uh, in the uranium. This was a problem investigated by Herb Anderson and uh, as you'll note the lattice pitch is eight and one quarter inches and the fuel sits in these wells cut in the graphite that are three and one quarter inches in diameter. I'm going to show you a few properties of this interesting artifact. Of course uh, beginning with, uh, with its radioactivity. We all know that uranium is radioactive and uh, this is no exception. Uh, this is real uranium in here and I have a Geiger counter here. I'm going to go ahead and turn it on You'll notice it's making a clicking sound. We have a meter here that indicates counts per minute. And I'm going to use an energy compensated Geiger Miller tube uh, with a beta shield, which will remain closed for this experiment. This happens to be an energy compensated probe, meaning that we can actually measure an exposure rate, Miller Rentgens per hour, when I put it here on the fuel. So I'm going to set this up on this left hand piece of fuel. And we'll go over, we'll see the uh, meter reading here, and I have this nice scaler, so I can actually take a uh, minute-long reading of the number of counts we receive in one minute. And this will enable us to calculate the uh, exposure rate due to this piece of uranium metal on, on contact with it. And the count has concluded. As you can see, we have about 8,000 or about 9,000 counts. This is equivalent with this probe to a dose rate or an exposure rate, I should say, of about 7.5 millirentgens per hour. Go ahead and turn this uh, noise off. So, no surprise there, this is real uranium metal in here. It is some of the first uranium that was ever purified. Uh, before 1942, there existed only about a single pound of uranium metal in all of the United States. And due to the requirements to build a reactor based on uranium metal, uh, all of the metallurgical techniques and technologies used to refine uranium had to be invented. And three companies using different techniques were responsible for making the uranium metal that went into the Chicago pile, all six tons of it, uh, Westinghouse had a role, Metal Hydrides Corporation had a role, uh, Iowa State University had a role, and these three institutions together manufactured six tons of metal, which all went into the central part of the Chicago pile core. The uh, uranium here, I can actually take the lid off. I 
made a new acrylic case for this. The old one was cracked. And so I can actually take a closer look at how this is put together. And you'll note uh, some interesting features of the... Uh, I wish this camera would get its act in gear. There we go. You'll notice some interesting features of this. For instance, I've mentioned earlier the three and a quarter inch diameter hole in which the two and one quarter inch fuel is sunk. This is because most of the fuel in the Chicago pile was what they called pseudospheres. It's uranium oxide pressed uranium oxide fuel pellets that left very little clearance here. But as the high pure you know, high purity fuel became available, the metal fuel, they began to uh, take a more, uh, they began to use more of that. And of course, they had to fit that into graphite that had been machined for pseudosphere fuel. So you get a number of different types of graphite blocks that were machined for either pseudosphere or for the metal itself. And this one has the machining for the pseudosphere, but it's got the metal elements fit into it. Um, so this was some of the first uranium metal ever mass-produced. Um, the fuel elements contain numbering. If we look down here real close and the camera cooperates, we can see that this one has the number M230L101P2. And I don't know what company that refers to. I don't know who made this fuel. I don't know what that number means. But if anybody watching this video has a clue, please, please, please let me know. The history here is just profound, and I would love to know if anybody can tell me what that means. The other one here on the right, the number is M170L79P1. Again, if you know what that means, I welcome your uh, comments in the video, and I will try to uh, uh, figure out what the, uh, what the history is of this particular fuel. We can also weigh the fuel now that, uh, now that I can take it out. Uh, and we can also look at the features of how it's set in here. And this, this brings up another question. So here's a piece of the fuel. You can see it's rough. It's, it's got these blobs on it. This was some of the first uranium ever refined by metallothermic technique. And uh, so it is a little rough on the edges. But uh, you've got to keep in mind, it was absolutely an amazing innovation. Uh, being able to produce ton quantities of this metal that before had only existed in trace quantities. Let's look back in the hole. What we've got in here is an acrylic spacer that allows that small fuel element to sit in a hole that was cut for much larger pseudosphere fuel. And this is a tight fit, but I think I can get it out. That is a tight fit, my goodness. This is a piece of acrylic I'm trying to weasel out of this hole. And it's coming slowly. I'm trying to pull a vacuum behind it, so it's a problem. There we go. I am not sure if this acrylic spacer was part of the original design of this type of block. They had many blocks like this where they wanted to put a small uh, uranium metal piece into a hole that was milled at three and a quarter inches for the pseudosphere fuel, but I don't know if they would have used acrylic to do that or if they just would have set the piece of uranium in the hole. That I'm not sure. But you can see down at the bottom of this hole it's chamfered and uh, it is designed to support that pseudosphere fuel out of which they thought they would be making most of this reactor. Now we've got this piece of nuclear fuel out of here, this piece of uranium metal. Let's whip it on over to the uh, the uh, scale here, and uh, we're going to take a look at how much it weighs. So, I'll wait for it to get done. So this is reading in grams. Go ahead and pop that on there. 2.564 kilograms is the mass of that piece of nuclear fuel. I'm not going to pull out the other one. Uh, I've already weighed it. It does weigh about the same, but uh, uh, within 0.2% or so of the other one. So at this point, they had managed to achieve uniformity and high purity in the uh, metallothermic process for making uranium metal. Um, very interesting history, and it, of course, happened very rapidly in 1942 uh, for the design of this reactor.
So there we go. We got the fuel back in here. Let's take a look at the graphite. This also has some interesting historical markings on it that let us know some things about how this reactor was built. In particular, on this side, and the camera is doing its best not to cooperate. There we go. We see this mark T01. Camera, I'm going to kill you if you don't do this. God, he's. Okay. T01. This tells us who made the graphite and what grade it is. T refers to the National Carbon Company's AGOT grade of nuclear graphite, which is a uh, pitch coke uh, product. Um, the purest graphite available to the builders of the Chicago pile. It had very low equivalent boron and a cross section below 5 millibarns for neutrons, making this premium material. This would have found its use near the center of the reactor. Um, the National Carbon Company also made another grade of graphite that was widely used in the Chicago pile, AGX. In fact, that was the earlier nuclear grade that was used to build a lot of the test piles before building the Chicago pile, which was intended to go critical. Uh, AGX uh, has a little bit of a higher cross-section, and uh, uh, AGOT was, as I mentioned, the premium material. Two other companies also made graphite for the Chicago pile in smaller quantities, but the majority of the pile was made out of this particular grade of graphite. And a number of subsequent reactors were also built out of AGOT from the National Carbon Company. Uh, Hanford reactors, the Oak Ridge uh, X10, Clinton pile as it was called. Uh, it went out of favor when the uh, nature of Wigner energy became understood in graphite and uh, was ceased to be manufactured in the uh, 1960s, I believe. So that's a history of the graphite and uh, also of the uh, uranium fuel. Now we've seen that the uranium is radioactive, so I'd like now to explore another absolutely fascinating radiological feature of this piece that has gives you great insight into its history. And to do that, I'm going to come over here to where I have a scintillation spectrometer. This happens to be a scintillator made out of sodium iodide with a little bit of thallium doping it. Light uh, is created when radiation enters this crystal material, and based on how much light is given off, you can determine the energy uh, or alternatively the wavelength of the gamma rays that are interacting with it. I've got here just a sample of uranium metal. This is uh, a piece of depleted uranium metal, but for all practical purposes it's, uh, it's uh, useful at illustrating the, uh, the gamma ray spectra from any sort of natural uranium. I've got that up here against the face of the sodium iodide scintillation crystal, and now we're going to gather a pulse height spectrum looking at the intensity of light emitted. And this will tell us, as I mentioned before, the spectrum, energy spectrum, of the radiation emitted from uranium. We have a log scale and the count scale, which is the vertical axis, and the horizontal axis is calibrated in terms of kilo electron volt uh, energy, gamma rays. Let me bring your attention to this main feature of this spectrum, which is a peak right there, about 1,000 keV or 1 mega, 1 mega electron volt. That peak right there is due to uranium-238's decay daughter, protactinium-234m. The decay of that produces, in a few, you know, small fraction of decays, a 1 MeV gamma ray, and that's what we're seeing right here. Uh, no surprise at all from this piece of uranium, it is exactly what we'd expect for natural uranium. Uh, it's giving off the decay uh, radiation from the daughter protactinium-234M in secular equilibrium with the uranium-238 parent. All right, so no surprise from this piece of uranium, but let's take a look at our nuclear fuel from the Chicago pile. Let's bring that scintillation. Fuck, oh, piece of shit. There we go. That'll be close enough. Cables are a little lean on this. Get that out of the way. So, we've got our sodium iodide detector. It's sitting in the vicinity of this nuclear fuel, which has been exposed to uh, a chain reaction in the Chicago pile. So, 
Let's see what the scintillation spectrum has to say about that. I'm going to hit clear and start. And immediately we see something that is drastically different in the energy spectrum from what we saw before. The other piece of natural uranium I showed you had a peak out here at 1000 keV. That being due to the protactinium daughter. And we still see that peak, but look at what is dominating. We've got this peak over here uh, between six and 700 keV. And that is due to a product of fission. That is due to cesium-137, which emits a gamma ray at 662 keV. Cesium-137 is one of the dominant fission products, the result of splitting a uranium nucleus into two pieces of uh, similar mass. Um, and it happens to have a long half-life of about 30 years. So we're seeing cesium-137 instead of protactinium 234M as a dominant radiation signature from this piece of uranium right here. And why is that? Well, it's because this is natural uranium that has been subjected to the operation of a nuclear reactor. This is nuclear fuel that has been discharged from an operating reactor, namely the first one, and it's produced a bunch of the radioisotope cesium-137. Now, originally, there'd be a lot of other stuff in there as well. You'd have uh, all kinds of other fission products, technetium, uh, you'd have uh, krypton-85, you'd have strontium-90. We still have strontium-90. It just doesn't emit gamma rays. We can't detect it by that signature, but there's still plenty of that in there. Uh, you would have had uh, all kinds of short-lived and long-lived radionuclides that are the result of the fission process, as well as some uh, neutron capture or activation products. Uh, plutonium-239, which is in here, but again, we can't detect it. So nuclear fuel that's been subject to operation in a nuclear reactor has a very different gamma energy characteristic than that which has simply been taken out of the ground. And now I'm going to share with you a high-resolution gamma spectrum. And uh, for this one, I'm grateful to my friends uh, over at the University of New Mexico, uh, Bob Bush and uh, uh, Ken Carpenter over at the NE Laboratory at the University of New Mexico, who uh, kindly allowed me to uh, bring this over onto their high-purity germanium uh, gamma spectrometer. And you can see the spectral lines here are, are much, uh, much higher resolution. They're sort of needles. Um, you can see that the protactinium 234M peaks are here, and the cesium 137 peak dominates them still. From this information, we can actually deduce, based on how much uh, cesium is here versus how much protactinium, and the assumption that the protactinium is in equilibrium with uranium, which is good given how old it is. Um, we can take those assumptions and determine how much burn-up or how much exposure this fuel has had to a nuclear reactor. It turns out that number is somewhere in the vicinity of 200 kilowatt days per ton of metal. And if you think about the burn-up of uh, nuclear fuel that's been discharged from a power reactor these days, we're talking about uh, gigawatt days per ton. Uh, even fuel that's discharged from experimental reactors or plutonium production reactors is still going to be in the numbers of uh, many uh, megawatt days per ton. So as nuclear fuel goes, this stuff has been just very lightly toasted, not really, not really cooked too hard, but still you can see that the cesium peak dominates the uh, gamma peaks from, uh, from the natural decay of uranium itself. But I want to be clear about one thing, and that is this gamma radiation, this cesium-137, excuse me, I should say this quantity of cesium-137 uh, cannot be explained by the operation of CP1 alone. Uh, it is far too high for CP1. CP1 ran initially at about half a watt, and one day... December 12, 1942, it happened to run for a short period of time at 200 watts. But we're talking about a burn-up in this fuel that is literally four or five orders of magnitude higher than anything that could be explained 
by the operation of CP1 alone. And that brings me to another interesting point uh, about the history of this particular fuel. As I mentioned before, this contains premium materials. It's got the AGOT graphite, and it's got the uranium metal, which was only a small fraction of the total uranium in the Chicago pile. They took apart CP1 in 1943, and over a period of about half a month or so, they moved all those pieces over to uh, the Pelos Forest Preserve uh, near Chicago, where they built CP2 out of the exact same materials. It was just thought to be a safer place to operate a reactor. The CP2 ran it up to 10 kilowatts, and they ran pants off that thing over the period from 1953, or from 1943 up to 1954. So it had a good decade-long operating history at much higher powers, and what I suspect is this nuclear fuel went from the Chicago pile, CP1, over into its replacement or its reconstruction at uh, the Palos Forest Preserve CP2, and it probably lasted a good long time being burned in that reactor and then was given out as an award after the nuclear fuel had come out of that reactor. And as he was involved at CP1, Herb Anderson was also intimately involved in the uh, CP2 reconstruction. It was the Chicago pile. It was the same pile, but it was built uh, with shielding and uh, uh, the provisions for some air cooling so they could do higher power experiments with it. So this is a very rare example of nuclear fuel that's been discharged from an operating reactor and turned into a commemorative item. Uh, you probably won't find any other examples of that happening um, because of the law, you know, and uh, anyway, <laughs> we'll see what my own state has to say about this residing here in my home. Uh, Hopefully they won't have too much of a beef about it, but uh, anyway, the, the dominant radiation signature is that of byproduct material, which here in the United States does pose a different regulatory situation than if you just have an unimportant quantity of source material. So the fact that this was in CP2 rather than just CP1 uh, is pretty much suggested by that gamma spectrum, and it does... Uh, implicate, or it does cause us to think about how this might be regulated as byproduct material rather than just an unimportant quantity of, uh, you know, natural uranium. All right, now I want to share a few words about this block's owner, Dr. Anderson. Um, if we look at some uh, historic documents, some photos, we can see his picture. Allow me to pull this up little booklet issued by uh, Argonne National Laboratory uh, in commemoration of this first nuclear reactor. If I open this to the page that shows these scientists who participated, we can see, of course, some familiar faces. Enrico Fermi. Herb Anderson's right here in the front row. He's, he's over on the right. Um, his contributions were many, but uh, he chiefly uh, understood the very important nature of the resonance capture of neutrons in uranium-238, both on its implications in uh, reactor operation and also in uh, plutonium production. And that information was classified for many years. Uh, like many of the uh, physicists of his generation, Herb got his start uh, in, uh, in ham radio. And uh, here is his QSL card. Uh, ham radio back then was sort of the gateway into uh, the world of modern physics. It was, uh, it was about the understanding of uh, electromagnetism, which was still a concept whose theories were, were not that far in the distant past uh, in the 1930s. So Dr. Anderson got his start in ham radio. Uh, he uh, subsequently scrounged parts and built a, a cyclotron at uh, Columbia University in New York. And when nuclear fission was announced in 1938, he was really in the right place at the right time. Uh, and from that point on, he sort of had a fairy tale career in physics. Uh, he was the first person in the United States at Columbia University, in fact, to, do, uh, to, to perform nuclear fission and demonstrate it here in the United States. And uh, that really launched his career working with Enrico Fermi and uh, the other scientists who went to work on the Manhattan Project. 
After the war, uh, he had an illustrious career uh, doing a lot of work with particle accelerators of various, various sizes. He died in 1988 uh, of a disease called, uh, called beryliosis, uh, the result of his early work with beryllium metal. As we now know, and as we did not know back then, beryllium metal is, uh, is very dangerous to the lungs in particular, and uh, uh, Dr. Anderson struggled through much of his later career with the effects of beryliosis. So we've talked about the operational history of this pile. We've talked a little bit about Herb Anderson and his history. Uh, I'll talk briefly about the history of the uranium that went into this pile. All of it came from one mine in West Africa in the Katanga province of what was then the Belgian colony of the Congo, is now the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Um, and for the last, oh, billion years or so before getting turned into this stuff, that uranium looked like this. It was a uh, black high-grade pitch blend deposit. This is ore from the Shinkalobwe mine in the uh, Democratic Republic of the Congo. Uh, this ore was stockpiled by the Belgians. Why were they interested in it before, uh, before the advent of fission? Well, uh, they weren't into it for the uranium, that's for sure. They were into it for the radium, which is a decay product of, uh, of uranium. And that's really what was useful and why this stuff was mined at Shinkalobwe. But uh, there were vast quantities of this available to the Manhattan Project uh, when CP1 was getting constructed. So this uranium has its origins uh, in 800-million-year-old uh, geology in Africa. It was uh, brought to New York and uh, was used for making the pile. Anyway, I hope... This video has uh, been instructive, it's been uh, interesting and informative, and uh, you know, this is a fascinating piece of history here. This is to nuclear science what the Wright Flyer is to aviation. It is an absolutely pivotal uh, piece of the actual substance of nuclear technology when it was born. It is a radiological record of the operation of two nuclear reactors, the Chicago Pile 1, and then the same reactor when it's rebuilt. And uh, so if you know anything else about this stuff, if you know the existence of another live block somewhere, uh, if you have an interest in displaying this somehow, if you have suggestions about uh, uh, its regulatory aspects here in the U.S., please get in touch with me. I love hearing from fellow enthusiasts. So thank you very much for your interest, and... Uh, uh, look forward to um, joining you next time with another physics video.